Topic 6C, Numerical Differentiation. Hopefully you watched the previous lecture to this on deriving finite difference approximations. You'll definitely need that to understand what is in this lecture. First, I'll describe numerical differentiation at a very high level, and then I'll give an example of how you perform numerical differentiation using MATLAB. With that done, I think you'll have a very good understanding of what's happening here, and then we can have a short conversation about boundary conditions. Numerical differentiation. We talk about numerical differentiation because very often we store a function as a series of discrete points, and in which case we don't have a closed form symbolic equation. So I'm showing here a function stored at seven points. We're not showing the values of the function because we may not know them. So what if we wanted to calculate the second order derivative of that function? How do we do that? Well, one thing is we need a way to approximate that second order derivative using a finite difference approximation. And what we did last lecture was derive those. So the simplest way to calculate the second order derivative at some point is to look at the function value at, at that point and the two surrounding points, and then we can approximate the second order derivative. So let's use this and apply that equation to every point on the grid to calculate the second order derivative. As a short example, let's look at point x2, the second point. We will write our finite difference approximation at the second point this way, and we'll see that it involves the function at point 1, point 2, and point 3. So we're using all of the, all of the function values surrounding f2. But recall from last lecture, we will be evaluating this finite difference at the position of x2. Then maybe we want to estimate the second order derivative at f5 using the same finite difference approximation. It's just now we're using different array indices and we, and we access f4, f5, and f6. It's the same finite difference equation, just we've shifted which function values we're using. In this case, they surround f5 and so we're evaluating the second order derivative at f5. And we could similarly write this a similar equation for every point on this grid. But at the very edges of the grid, let's write those finite difference equations and see if you notice a problem here. Is there a problem? Well, if we are evaluating our second order finite differences with terms on either side, our finite differences require terms from outside of our grid, something we're not even storing. And we have to fix this. And the manner in which we fix it is called a boundary condition. Uh, not to be confused with when you were in physics or maybe you took electromagnetic theory, we talked about boundary conditions or what happens at interfaces. This is a numerical boundary condition, and it simply addresses this problem that happens at the edge of the grid, and we need to handle that. So there's a variety of ways to handle that. We'll be talking about some, but let's do uh, one here. Instead of using the simple finite difference approximation that we did, what if we derived completely new finite difference equations special equations just for those endpoints. So we want to evaluate the derivative, the second order derivative at the endpoint. We already know we're going to have to use function values to the right of that. And we would love to have values scattered on either side for best accuracy. So maybe we decide to add a point to our finite difference just to increase the accuracy a little bit. So we will use a four point finite difference where when we derive that finite difference, we set up our offset coordinates, our x tilde coordinates, with a zero in the first position. So that's where we're evaluating the finite difference. Point x2 will be at h, point x3 is at 2h, and point x4 will be at 3h. So using this set of offset coordinates, we can derive this finite difference equation to estimate the second order derivative of f at point 
x1. So the point at f1 gets its own very special finite difference equation. We could do the same thing for the last point. And the only difference is how we define the points in this little tiny offset uh, set of x points. Here we put a zero in the last position because we want to calculate the finite difference, the second order derivative, at the last point uh, in this array of points at f7. And we want to use information from f6, f5, and f4. So f6 would be located at minus h, f5 located at minus 2h, and f4 located at minus 3h. So given these coordinates for x tilde, we can derive this finite difference approximation. And you can look at the coefficients of these two finite difference equations and you can see some similarities. Ultimately, we want to calculate the second order derivative at every single point in our grid. So for points F2 to F6, we can use our ordinary finite difference approximation. So we can set up a for loop and we can go over all of those and calculate the second order derivative. At the boundary points, we had to derive their own unique finite difference approximations, and the boundary points are always a problem like this. And so this is what we would do across the entire grid. And in the next section, when we talk about how to do this in MATLAB, we'll proceed with this. On to calculating numerical derivatives using MATLAB. So we have our seven point grid, and at this point we'll know our function values at points one through seven, but we want to calculate and probably plot the second order derivative. How do we do that? Well, all of the MATLAB code that you need is shown in the upper left. And what I wanna do now is step through this one line of code at a time and show you how it calculates the second order derivative at each point, one through seven. So we execute the first line of code. Now I'm showing a few things here. One is I highlighted which line of code is being executed. The second thing, this red line of code, I'm showing the line of code being executed. It's obvious for this case. However, when we get into the loop, I'm showing that same line of code, but showing the array indices explicitly, whereas in the loop, they're just NX and maybe a little bit abstract. So I'm showing what the equivalent explicit line of code would be here. The other thing I'm showing is the specific finite difference equation that's being used for the point being evaluated. I'm pointing to which point is being evaluated, and I'm also highlighting which range of points are being used to evaluate the finite difference. So all that just for the first line of code, it's using F1 to F4 and evaluating the second order derivative at position F1. Okay, let's move to the next. Now we've entered the loop. And over here, I'm showing the loop counter. So we're at position X2 in our grid. I'm highlighting which line of code is being executed. And since little nx is two, this is the line of code that's at, that MATLAB is actually running. And I'm showing the array indices in here explicitly. So you can see it's using F1, F2, and F3. Also showing the finite difference approximation, how it was derived in terms of the x coordinates, which point is being evaluated, and I'm highlighting the ranges of the function values being used to evaluate the second order derivative. So doing this, we calculate the second order derivative at point F2. At this point, it becomes somewhat repetitive. We move over to point F3, the same finite difference approximations used. The only thing that's different is our loop counter is now three. Loop counter is four. We evaluate the finite difference at position four. Loop counter is five. And we're evaluating the finite difference at the fifth position. This is the last iteration of the loop because big NX equals seven, big NX is where we're going to end the, or how many points we have, and we're ending our loop at big NX minus one. So uh, since little NX equals six, this is the last iteration. We're evaluating the second order derivative at point six. 
Then we reach the very last point, which is a boundary point and requires its own special finite difference approximation. And in the lower right, I'm showing how that was derived. And of course, we did that a few slides ago. And that's it. At this point, we have evaluated the second order derivative at every point across the grid, including the boundary points, which got their own special equations. So we talked at a high level what numerical differentiation is, and we also discussed a little bit about the problem at the boundary. We need values from outside of the grid, so we had to rederive our finite difference equations to handle that. It turns out there's other boundary conditions that are sometimes useful, so let's discuss some of those. This is the boundary condition we used up to this point. I would call it a higher order boundary condition. And we recognize that we're not doing our finite difference in the very best way at the edge of the grid because we're using values to its side. We tend to like to span the values from which we're evaluating the finite difference from both sides of a point. So since we're not doing that here, I just decided to use an extra term. Is that absolutely necessary? Uh, depends on your application, but we did it here as a good example. So all of the points through the grid, points two through six, are evaluated with the standard finite difference, and we derive special finite difference equations at the boundary. So I call that a higher order boundary condition. On to the next one. The easiest of the boundary conditions is called Dirichlet boundary conditions. When we use those, we assume values outside of the grid are zero. So where we would need to access F0, for example, we'll just put a zero in its place. Where we would need to access F8, we just put a zero in its place. Again, those finite differences at the edge are their own special unique finite differences, but it's a bit easier than on the previous slide than when we did the higher order boundary conditions. We're still essentially using the same finite difference. We just set a term to zero, which changes what it looks like a little bit. Now, when we do this, we really do force the value of the function to be zero at the edges. And so if you're doing an electromagnetic simulation, and this is the electric field, if we're forcing the electric field to zero, it's like we've surrounded it with a mirror, conductors. If we have waves on this grid, they'll bounce off those edges. So why would we use this? Well, very often we'll simulate something where Whatever's happening is just happening in the middle of the grid and it decays to zero going, from way, going away from whatever's happening in the middle. And so when it decays to zero, then we don't need to do anything more sophisticated. <laughs> I'm breaking in my new tongue. We don't need to do anything more sophisticated at the boundaries because the function goes to zero. So Dirichlet works beautifully for those circumstances. Very often in science and engineering, we want to simulate periodic structures. There's a whole cool, neat story behind periodic structures, but folks use these to make things invisible, um, do things like negative refraction. A lot of cool stuff happens. So if our simulation is periodic, then that means if we're calculating our finite difference at point F1 and we need to access F0, if this really is periodic, then F0 will be the same value as F7. So all we'll do is we'll use F7 instead of F0. And likewise, at this edge of the grid, if we're calculating our finite difference here and we need an F8, if this problem really is periodic, then F8 has to be the same thing as F1. And so we would just use F1 in the place of F8, and we've incorporated periodic boundary conditions. This is used all the time. Another boundary condition that's useful is called the Newman boundary condition. And the Newman boundary condition assumes that whatever the function is doing at the edge, it keeps doing it as it leaves the grid in a linear manner. So it extrapolates that it, it follows a straight line at the edge of the grid. So if it's linear at the edge of the grid, the Newman boundary conditions requires our second order derivatives to be zero, right? Because the second order derivative of a straight line is zero. So the second order derivatives at the boundaries are zero. Well, what about the first order derivatives? Well, at the intermediate points, 
If we want to calculate the first order derivative of F2, it's simply F3 minus F1 divided by the spacing, which is 2H here. Now at the edge of the grid, we would like to say that the first order derivative is F2 minus F0 divided by the spacing, but of course the F0 doesn't exist. So what we'll do, rather than take our finite difference over the span of two points, we'll just do it over the span of this one point. And our finite difference is F2 minus F1 divided by the spacing. And we can also recognize this as a forward finite difference. And we could choose to do a higher order accurate derivative. Maybe have three or four terms in there. That's fine too. But the point is the Newman boundary condition is assuming that the function leaves this grid linearly.